Good morning, Life Fellowship. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Amen. We just want to say to you guys, if you're visiting with us today, we are so glad to have you. And for us, it's just a life event. That's just the way that it is. We love coming to the house of God, and we love just celebrating who God is, because God is amazing. He's incredible, and He loves all of us so. And I was just thinking this morning, you know, we are so unique. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, uh, sometimes we only think about skin color as being unique. But let me just say, we are all so unique, every one of you. And yet God loves each and every one of you, uh, every one of us. He has designed us the way we are. He has designed us the way we are. So we are so proud of you guys. Thank you for being here today. Let's jump right into God's Word. If you'll take your Bible with me today, let's turn to two passages of Scripture. Turn with me to Romans 1, Romans chapter 1. If you're looking for that, it's the book between Acts and 1 Corinthians, okay? Romans 1, and then, uh, then turn over and get a marker, put a marker at John 1, just two books back, all right? John chapter 1. We're starting a brand new series of messages this weekend called Team Unashamed, Team Unashamed. And here's what we're actually asking is that every believer would join the team. Because uh, I think that, and I, want, I, want, I wish everyone in our church uh, I wish, well, let me just say this, I wish everyone in our church were believers, I really do, but, you know, but beyond that, we're asking that every believer say, I want to be a part of, the, of Team Unashamed, and someone may ask the question, how do I, how do I become a member? How do I get a, become a, not a member of Life Fellowship, how do I become a member of Team Unashamed, okay? Real simple, be unashamed about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I want us to get to the place where we realize we're on the same team, we're on the team of the Lord Jesus Christ, and He has given us an amazing Word of God to be able to take to the world. And so we need to be members of Team Unashamed. Uh, turn with me, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, look down with me. I want us all to look at this, I, I hope that you'll highlight it, underline it. This is a very, very important verse to us who are in the faith. So it says this, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay, I, I want you to get this. I wish that we would just grab hold of this verse because here's what it says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and to the Greek. I, I wish we would just grab hold of that and understand God loves us all, and He wants us all to be on His team, and we don't have to be ashamed of what God has done. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. And then the very next verse, verse 17 says, for in it, talking about the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, for in it uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Let me, let me remind you of a verse of scripture that's in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. It says, uh, for it is impossible to, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith. And so God wants us to live a faith life. Someone says, well, how do I live a faith life? Okay, you, you, I'm going I'm to break it down as simple as I know how. Okay, here's how you can live a faith life. When you get to the place where you are unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, realizing that it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, when you get to that place, you'll start living by faith. I'm telling you. And so that's what this entire message is about. This is what this series is about, that we would come to the place where we are unashamed of Jesus Christ, that we really know that what he has done has really been great for us, and it's good for everyone else too. And so I want us to get to that place. We're unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to read this. You know, I'm reading, I read a lot of times out of the New American Standard uh, Version, uh, and, and so there are different versions of the Bible uh, there's basically three different versions. You have a uh, word-for-word -word translation, which is what I use, New American Standard Bible. That's what I study out of. Word-for-word uh, -for -word is like New American Standard. It's like New King James. Uh, it can be King James Version. There's several word-for-word -word translations. But then you also have what's called a dynamic translation. And what that is, it is a translation, and they do look at the words of it, but in the midst of doing word-for-word, -word, they put thoughts in at the same time to try and help you to, to express a little bit deeper. And then you have what is called a paraphrase version, uh, and this really is a thought-for-thought thought version. In other words, here's the thought, and let us give you words that are in a modern language so that you can understand it in a totally different way. It's not really a word-for-word. Word. So someone says, well, which one should we read? Well, I, I like them all, to be honest with you. I read a lot of different versions. Uh, I like word-for-word word to study, 
But when I'm doing my devotion, I like a thought for thought. And so I will read the word for word for study, and then I'll read a thought for thought for devotion time. And so I was reading this in the Message Bible, which is a thought for thought. I want you to hear this. Here's what it says. It's news, talking about the good news, it's news I'm most proud to proclaim. Uh, this extraordinary message of God's power, powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts in Him, starting with Jews and then right on to everyone else. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith, confirming what Scripture has said all along. I like this. Watch this. You ought to underline this. The person in right standing before God by trusting Him really lives. <laughs> really lives. And here's what I'm afraid. I'm afraid that we have today... Uh, a church full of people who have come to life in Jesus, but have never really truly lived out the abundant life in Jesus. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and, and, that's a conjunction meaning there's more than just life. I've come to give you life and that you might live it to its fullest or have it to live it in its abundance, depending on which version that you use. So here, here's what God's saying. Don't just live. Live in the abundance of it. I've got something great for you. Well, listen, the great abundance of life is this. And someone says, how do I really live? Really simple. When we come to the place where we're unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Greek. I, I wish we would just grab hold of that, gravitate to it. And that's what this entire series of messages is about. It is about being unashamed of God's Word. And so today I want to talk about a brother. We're going to look at a brother in God's Word. Turn with me to John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1, and let's read about this brother, okay? So drop down to verse 35. It says, again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And we'll talk about who those disciples are in a moment. But it says he was standing with two of his disciples. Now when it talks about John there, he's not talking about the Gospel writer John, the Apostle John. He's talking about John the Baptist, okay? So he says, next day, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, behold, the Lamb of God. That's an important statement that we see here. John the Baptist says to the two disciples who were with him, behold, uh, the Lamb of God. Uh, and verse 37 says, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated, uh, which is translated Peter. Okay, so I want you to kind of get this. kind of interesting. We actually find, uh, let's start with Simon. We, we have several characters that we see in this story. We see Andrew. Uh, we see Peter. Uh, and then there's, there's an unnamed person. Obviously, Jesus is in the story. Uh, John the Baptist is in the story, but there's an unnamed disciple that's not here. We, we never find out what his name is. Uh, most theologians agree and believe, and I, as I do, that the person who is unnamed here is actually John, the writer of this gospel. And there's several reasons that we believe that. One of them we find in Mark chapter 1, we'll talk about in a few moments. But the, the other reason is because John doesn't like to name himself. Uh, we see this throughout the Gospel of John. Anytime there's a story where he's involved in it, he will not even name his name. He will say, uh, and the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, but, so he, but he won't name his own name. It's almost like he, he, he wants to try and stay off the scene. He doesn't really want you to see who he is. He just wants you to know his whole decision is to point people to Jesus. It's not to point him people to John. Does that make sense? And so he's an unnamed disciple here. I'll show you more why I believe that it's John. But here we find Peter. Most of us know who Peter is. Peter was the man who stood up on Pentecost and he began to preach uh, just, uh, just a few days earlier. I'm talking about 53 days earlier. He was denying Jesus. You know, he said, I'll never deny you. And three times in front of a little teenage girl, he said, I don't know who he is. And he even blasphemed and even cursed in front of a little girl just to prove he didn't know who he was. 53 days later, you know, they, they hide out in this upper room, uh, scared to death. 53 days later, Peter, I guess, came to his senses and thought, that's enough of that. And he stands up on Pentecost and begins to proclaim, Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. 
and 3,000 people come to know the Lord. I, I, lo I love this little passage here because John tells us something interesting here. He says that Jesus said, you're Simon, uh, but I'm going to start calling you Cephas at this moment. So I, I was thinking a, a lot about that, uh, talk, thinking about, you know, how Jesus kind of had a little pet name for him. And I, I kind of do this too. I, uh, when I'm with the teenagers, a lot of times if I hang out with you long enough and I find out who you are, uh, I, will, I will give you a nickname. It's just this, I mean, my dad always did that. So I, I just give people nicknames. And so, uh, and I give nicknames different than the way Jesus does. So we have like a, a young teenage girl, one of my most recent uh, victims. And uh, uh, her name is Tatum, and she goes to our youth group here and comes to church here. Well, I just started nicknaming her Tater. So anyway, she's Tater now. Now, let me tell you, the way Jesus nicknames is way different than the way we nickname. Uh, because uh, I nicknamed to make fun of you. So anyway, but <laughs> Jesus, I, <laughs> I'm kidding, seriously. So, so anyway, <laughs> but anyway, but when Jesus names us, I want you to think about this. When Jesus names us, when he gives a nickname, he is God and he can see beyond today and see what you will become. Amen. Let's be honest, Peter at this moment is not a rock. Uh, he is a shaken stone. In fact, for the next three and a half years, he won't be a rock. He's just a shaken stone. Uh, but one day he stands up and becomes the rock of the church. So let me, let me say so that you understand this. Uh, Jesus obviously is the rock, but Peter was a stone. And here's the reality. Every one of us who are followers in Jesus Christ, we also are stones. We are living stones. The Bible tells us that. We are living stones. We are, we are a foundation upon which the church is built. So when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's what Peter became. Well, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about Peter today, but I really would like to talk about Andrew, his brother. In all the years I have looked at messages, I have never one time that I remember or that I recall hearing a message on Andrew, talking about Andrew's life. And there's probably a good reason for that, because there's only three passages of Scripture in all of the Bible that talk about Andrew. And I want us to look at, so one of those that we see is right here in this passage. Now, something that's very interesting, we need to kind of get a grip on, is when we're looking in John, John writes his gospel totally different than Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Those are three, there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's an argument to be made, and I'm on the side of this argument, that Acts also is a gospel. The word gospel just simply means good news, all right? And so you, it is, you see in the book of Acts, the, the acts of the gospel in the lives of believers after Jesus has departed, okay? So I, I call Acts the gospel of Acts. That's how I look at it. But the, the four Gospels primarily are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are actually what we call the synoptic Gospels. And then John is what we call, it's actually uh, separated from those three. And here's why. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John pretty much, uh, excuse me, Matthew, Mark, and Luke spend most of their try time trying to prove to you that Jesus was 100% man. Although he was God, they want you to know that he's 100% man. He has literally taken on flesh. Okay, we, he, that's what they spend the time doing. John, on the other hand, does uh, something unique. He, he changes it a little bit. He spends the majority of his time saying to you, Jesus, who, yes, was 100% flesh, is 100% God. And he spends his entire time, devotes the entire book to proving to you that he was more than a man. He was God in flesh. That's why in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, just so you understand, I'll go and show you and prove this in a moment, but when it talks about the Word, it's talking about Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus. And I believe this goes all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so John says, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Someone says, how do you know it was Jesus? Because in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus took on flesh, and dwelt among us. And so John spends the entire book showing that Jesus was more than a man, and he had the ability of omniscience. He had the ability of omnipresence. He had the ability of omnipotence. In other words, he's all-powerful. He's omnipresent. Uh, he's everywhere all the time, and he knows everything. And so you see that when John writes in the gospel. And that's important to, so when we look at this story that John is writing and recording for us, that we understand that there is a knowledge that Jesus has that no other man has. Okay, so let's talk about Andrew. Now, Andrew, uh, in the Bible, uh, his name means manly, uh, or it means bold, 
or it means brave. That's what the word Andrew means. I, I love that name. Uh, I think that'd be a great name to name your son. I really do. You know, to name him Andrew. Uh, several years ago, we had a young man that I know, uh, now has grown up, uh, is a man now, uh, but his name was Andrew, and I started calling him Andy, called him Andy all the time, because I told him that Andy was closer to the name of God that, you know, and he, he said, what do you mean? That's like God. I said, well, because there's a song that was written about that, and, it's, and it goes like this, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. So anyway, just, just my thoughts, that's, you know, life in the perspective of Mark Allen, but anyway. But I love the name Andrew because it really does. It means manly. It means bold. It means brave. And that's what God has really called the church to be. He wants us to be manly. He wants us to be bold. He wants us to be brave. He wants us to be the people of God, His chosen people, not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what His name means, Andrew. But I noticed some things about His life that I think that are really things that every believer ought to take on themselves. Uh, the, the way that He is is the way that every believer should be. Uh, let, me, let me show you one of those things. Let me give you the first thing. That is, Andrew followed the Lord. It says in verse number 37, the two disciples heard him speak, one of those being Andrew, and they followed Jesus. I want you to think about that. Andrew followed Jesus. Why? Why did he follow Jesus? You got to catch this. Because the Baptist said, he's the Lamb of God. And Andrew believed, if he's the Lamb of God, I'm going to follow him. You get that? Listen, this is what every believer needs in their life, to come to the place where they said, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, let me help you just a little bit. Being a follower of Jesus means to be where he is at. Uh, being a follower of Jesus is more than just saying, well, I believe there is a Jesus. Being a follower means that whatever he says, whatever he does, wherever he goes, I want to be right there. That's a follower. A follower says, wherever Jesus is, that's where I'm going to be. That's a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm concerned about the church today. I believe in the church today we have a lot of people who are fans of Jesus, but they don't follow Jesus. Their lifestyle doesn't follow Jesus. They do what they want to do, and if Jesus happens to fit, and if something better doesn't come along, then they'll do what the Lord wants. Well, let me just say... God, if you're going to be an unashamed team member, then we've got to follow Jesus. Amen? Good. Ten people. Amen. That's better than the early service. I'm, I'm all excited. <laughs> this is what God's demanding of us. And I, I think sometimes we don't, we don't take this serious. I think that we really think that it's just, you know, if I'm going to be at church, preacher, as long as something better doesn't come along. I'm, I'm telling you, this is where we are today. And God is saying be my follower. And that's what Andrew did. He was a follower. I, I notice verse 38. I love what happens here. Jesus turns, he sees them following as if he didn't already know. <laughs> and he said to them, uh, what do you seek? And they said to him, and they asked a question. He said, what do you seek? And they said, uh, where are you staying? It's kind of interesting. Two questions. We don't see the answer to what they seek. But the answer is in the question. I'll show it to you. So when I first saw that, what do you seek? I thought, that's a bad question. Now, not that I'm giving advice to Jesus, because he is God. But in my first reaction was, why didn't he ask, who are you seeking? But I really believe he asked the right question. What are you seeking? Do you realize that when people come to church today, they are seeking something? We are all seeking something. And I think the question is, what is it that you're seeing? Do you realize that when people come, sometimes uh, what people seek when they come to this church, they seek the music. There's a lot of people come because they love the music. And we have great music, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, you know. Uh, some people, when they come, they come for the message. They come for the preaching of the Word, and they don't like the music. So, you know, and some people come for the music and don't like the preaching. So, you know, it's, it goes both ways, right? But he, and I think it is a good question. What is it that you're seeking? What is it? And, I, and if I could say... What I really would like, I would like for us to get to the place where we stop getting into what are we seeking and that we would ask ourselves, it's not what I'm seeking, it's who do I want to seek? But we seek you first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. We need to come to the place where we stop asking the question, what? And I think it was a great question he was asking because he realized that humanity, we tend to want something. So we want a what rather than a who. And so he wanted to know, where's your heart? Well, they reveal where the heart was by the answer. The answer was, where are you staying? Now, you may not catch it, 
But this word staying that we find in this verse here is actually a very repeated phrase that we find throughout the Bible. In fact, throughout the New Testament. This word, Greek word, meno, for the word staying, actually occurs 112 times in the New Testament. Would you say that that might be an important word? In fact, I'll take it even a step further. John, the gospel writer, uh, John writes this word, meno, 66 times in in four books because he wrote John, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. He writes it 66 times. Okay, let me, let me break that fur- down even further so you can catch this, okay? In the Gospel of John, he records the word meno 40 times. Can we say that that might be important? But even that, think about this. 1st John, which is a very short book, 1st John, he records this word meno 20 three times in one book. Tiny little book. The reason I want to bring that up is this is an, this is an important word and John knows that it's an important word. And so John records this saying uh, where the disciples said, where are you staying? Now, uh, let me give you the definition of the word staying so that you can understand why it's so important. Obviously, it means to stay. Also, means the word mino means to dwell. But to go a little deeper, it means to last or to continue. Uh, I, I, I kind of wonder if they were asking the question, uh, where are you going to last? Will you continue? Will you be here? Can, can I tell you something I have found out about Jesus? He has lasted 2,000 years from, from the cross. And he will last well beyond that. Do you, do you understand that? And they were asking, where are you staying? Uh, wh- where are you continuing? But to go even deeper, there's a deeper theological meaning to this. Obviously, it means to remain. It also means to continue. But I like this word. It means to abide. Uh, it is interpreted as abide several times in the Scripture. John chapter 15 records this as one of Jesus' most important messages that he ever preached. In John chapter 14, uh, verse 4, see if you hear the word meno or the word stay. Okay, watch this. Verse uh, 4, 15, 4 says, abide in me. The word abide is the word stay. It's the word meno. Okay, let me just say this a little different. I'm going to read the entire passage just a little different. See if you catch what he's saying, okay? Uh, Stay in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it stays in the vine. So neither can you unless you stay in me. Can you understand that a follower is someone who stays where the Lord is? And they ask the question, where are you staying? What do you want? We want to be where you are staying. Do you understand that? In other words, this is what a follower does. A follower is always wanting to be where the Lord is at. Verse 5 of that same chapter says, I am the vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. He who stays in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Verse 6 says, if anyone does not stay in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them, and they cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7 says, if you stay in me, and my words stay in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, I want you just to pick up on this. This is really incredible. He says, if you'll stay in me, you can ask me whatever you want, and I'll do it. Okay, if you'll be where I'm at, if you'll go where I'm at, if you'll stay where I'm at, you can ask me, and I'll do it. Okay, get this. Go back now to John 1, and what did they say? Where are you staying? And God says, I'll do it. Are you following that? In other words, if you want to be where I'm at, then you'll be where I'm at, and you can ask what I want, and you can get in on my power. You can get in on my strength. This is what I think a lot of believers are wanting, but they're unwilling to actually do the following part. So God is asking us to be a follower of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, look down, John chapter 1, verse 39. So after asking the question, where are you staying? Jesus answers and says to them, come and you will see. Now this, is, again, remember, John is writing this from from the perspective that Jesus is 100% God. So there's always little things that we can catch in what he's saying. And here's what he's saying. He says, uh, if you'll come, then you will see. Do you realize that before you can see, you have to come? Every time. In fact, I, I find that there's people that say, you know, if I could just see, then I would come. Jesus says, that's not the way this works. You have to believe in me first, and then you will see. 
Many, many people are not seeing God because they won't come to God. Jesus said, if you'll come, you'll see. And then I like how it follows that up. It follows it up by saying, so they came and they saw. That's what it says. So you, and sometimes we miss those little statements, but the Bible is trying to tell us he is God. And if you'll come to him, you'll get to see. So they came and they saw uh, where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. So here's what we need to know. God is calling us. He demands from us that we'll be followers of him, not just fans, followers of Jesus Christ. Here's the, here's the second thing that Andrew did that I think that he did right. Uh, he not only followed, he found. Now I know he found Jesus. I, I, I get that. Okay, he found Jesus. I, I understand that. But I want you to notice what the Word of God says down in verse 41. It says, he found first his own brother, Simon. And he said to him, we have found the Messiah. Uh, love that word. He says, we found the Messiah. Think about this. He says, which is translated Christos. The reason they're saying, it, which is translated Christos, is because evidently he used a Hebrew word here for the word Messiah. He's been writing the whole time in Greek. And so he, he writes, he says a Hebrew word. We have found Hamashiach, which is Messiah. And then he says, which is interpreted Christos in the Greek. Now, the reason I think that's important is because he's saying the word is important here. The, 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 the word for Messiah is important. And so the word Messiah in the Hebrew literally means the anointed one. Now, the Israelites really understood this greatly because they had seen what an anointed one was. In order to be king of Israel, you had to be anointed. And so they would, before Saul became king, before David became king, before Solomon became king, they, they, they came out, Samuel came out to David, and he took a, a flask of oil, and he poured it over David's head, and he anointed him with oil. Oil is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. And so the king was a picture of what the Messiah would be, someone who was anointed with oil or anointed with the Holy Spirit. And here's what they make the proclamation. Here's what Andrew says to Peter. We have found the one who has the Holy Spirit. We have found the one who was, who, who, there's never been a one like this one ever before. Before, we used physical oil. Now, we see the real oil of God on him. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the chosen one from the beginning of the world. And he goes to his brother and he says this. The other part that I think is interesting, it, it, we talk about that he found Jesus, yes, but notice it says he first found his brother. Let me tell you, there is no one more important in this world than other family members coming to know the Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, I, I'm not saying that your friends are not important. I'm saying to you, the most important thing is that your family would come to know the Lord. Uh, praise God. I thank God. I, it's my wife and I and my two children and all four of us know the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I am so grateful that my brother and my brother-in-law both know the Lord. I am so grateful that my sister and my sister-in-law both know the Lord. I am so grateful that their children all know the Lord. Because I'm telling you, the most important thing in your life is that your family would come to know the Lord. And he went and he found his brother. Uh, I have all the time people who will come to me and they'll say, Pastor, will you pray for my uh, mother? Will you pray for my father? Will you, will you pray for my brother? Will you pray for my sister? And, and obviously we will. We, we love praying for your family members. But whenever you ask them why, why do you want me to pray for your family? Here's uh, inevitably what they'll say. Well, they don't know the Lord. And, it's, and then they'll follow it up with something like, hey, would you go talk to them? Okay, listen to me. I, it's not that I'm opposed to talking to people about Jesus. I am not. But I'm telling you, your testimony about Jesus being Lord of Lords and King of Kings in your life is more powerful than my testimony who has no blood relation. You know, blood is thicker than water. It, it, you have more value as a brother going to a brother or a sister going to a sister or a brother going to a sister or a brother going to a mother or a father or a mother or father going to a son or a daughter or a grandparent than I'll ever have influence in their lives. And so let me just answer the question for you. No, I won't. You go talk to them. If you're concerned about them, go tell them. They'll believe you. Go tell them, I have found the Messiah. I have found the anointed one. A few years ago, uh, several years ago, right after we first moved here, my grandmother uh, fell ill and was in a hospital down south of here, close to Houston, and uh, she went into an, a coma, and uh, was, they d didn't know if she would ever be responsive again, and they expected with just, just in a few days that she would pass and go to be with the Lord. Uh, but I, I was not sure about her salvation. I didn't know if she knew the Lord or not, because her lifestyle did not indicate that of what a believer should be. 
And so I began to just pray for her every day. And finally, the Lord woke me up one morning. He woke me up and he said, you need to go down and see your grandmother today. And I dropped everything that I had on my schedule for that day. And I got in the car and I drove down there. I think it was about four and a half, five hours away. I drove down there, uh, not expecting to go in the hospital and not to be able to talk to her because she was unresponsive. I walked in the hospital. My aunt is coming down the hallway. She says, you came on the perfect day. I hadn't even talked to her that day. She didn't even know I was coming. She said, because Mama, that's what we call her, Mama just woke up. And I knew right there in that moment, God was saying, you need to go talk to her. Amen. I walked in that room. My aunt and my uncle were there. And we talked for a little while, just kind of ch chatted about different things. And then finally, I just said, you know, one of the hardest things you'll ever do is to talk to family members about God. And so I looked at my aunt and my uncle and I said, would you guys excuse Mama and I for just a moment? There's some things that I need to talk to her about. And so they walked out and I looked at my grandmother and I said, I, I feel like God sent me down here to ask you, do you know Jesus as your Savior? He's the best thing that's ever happened to me and I'm not sure about your salvation. And I want you to know the Lord because I realize you may not have much time left. Well, I, I, I'm not going to tell you the outcome or the end of that story because it's really not important because do you realize our job is not to save people? Our job is to tell people. I'm telling you. And I, I believe, I have confidence that one day I'll see my grandmother again in heaven. I really do. But listen, I'm telling you, uh, what if I had just said, you know, Lord, I'm just not going to go. I, I'm just not going to tell her. What I would be saying is, it's really not that important, their eternal destination. Now, I think it's interesting. We look in the Scripture. Something really interesting that takes place. Think about this. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning. And then it goes to, later on down passage, it talks about two, it talks about two brothers. Uh, if you go to Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then you get to Genesis 4, and it talks about two brothers. But with two totally different outcomes. Let me just show it to you, because I think that this really does parallel Genesis. So let me just read this, Genesis 4, verse 9. You know the story, Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain brought uh, from, uh, from uh, his crops, and Abel brought from his flocks. But someone says, why, why did God show favor on Abel over Cain's? Okay, here's the reason why. And again, it talks to us a little bit about being a follower. Uh, Abel brought of the first of his flocks, not knowing if there'd be enough left for him. That's faith, Right? Uh, Cain, the Bible says, brought of his crops in the process of time. You can go read it. It's right here in Genesis 4. In the process. In other words, if he had leftovers, he brought them to God. And God had favor in Abel's because there was faith in Abel's and there was no faith in Cain's. Okay, you need to hear this. This is what a, fo a follower says. It's not about me. It's about him. Did y'all hear that? So we need to bring the first to God, first of our time first of our talents, first of our treasures, and, and by faith, trust that God will take care of the rest. This is what a believer does. That's what a, that's what a follower does of Jesus Christ. And so uh, Cain got upset because God showed favor on Abel and not on him because he, Abel did what was right. And so watch this. I'm going to pick up the story. He murders uh, Abel, and I'll pick up the story uh, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? Okay, you got to notice it. Notice it's a question. Uh, here's what you need to know. Here's what he's saying. Uh, go find your brother. Okay? Think about the story of Andrew, and he went and found his brother. But Cain wouldn't go find his brother. And so notice what happens. He says, Where's your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Okay, um, let me answer the question for us. Are we our brother's keeper? Let me give you the answer. Yes. Let me, let me say it real, real clear. Are you your brother's keeper? Yes. Every one of us are our brother's keeper. That was the answer that God was looking for, but Cain didn't want to keep his brother. He hated his brother. I'm telling you that if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, the answer is that we need to ha stop hating our brother and start loving our brother. That, that means that God is saying to us, when I talk about a brother, I'm talking about a mother, I'm talking about a father, I'm talking about a cousin, I'm talking about a niece and a nephew, I'm talking about aunts and uncles, I'm talking about grandparents and grandchildren and sons and daughters, I'm talking about every member of your family. Are we our family's keeper? And the answer is yes. Verse 10 goes on to say this. He said, what have you done? 
The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And here's what we catch in this. There is life after death. Abel had died, but God could still hear his voice. I'm telling you, there is life after death. And if we really believe this, we would want, and we knew that we had the answer to life after death, wouldn't we want to give it to everyone? For I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Jew or Greek, it doesn't matter. There is no distinction. Are you, are you hearing me? This is why I'm telling you, God is calling us to not only follow, but he's calling us to find our families. That's what God's calling us to. Here's the third thing Andrew did. Not only did he find, he found, but he forwarded. Notice verse number 42. He, Andrew, brought him, Peter, to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. Now, when I talk about forwarding, here's what I'm talking about. Someone says, well, why didn't you just use the word he brought? Because it's something more than this. You need to understand that what he was doing was more than just bringing someone to Jesus. He was advancing the kingdom of God. He was forwarding what he received freely. Uh, there was a movie a few years ago called Pay It Forward. Listen, I'm telling you, what we get, we should forward on to others. When God brings his kingdom alive in our lives, he didn't bring his kingdom in our lives so that we could just hold on to it and keep it for ourselves. He brought his kingdom in our lives so that we can advance his kingdom. And let me tell you, there's no better place to advance the kingdom of God than in a family member's life. And so he found his brother Peter, and he brought him to Jesus. Uh, when I was looking at this, you know, there's not really a lot of other stories that we find about Andrew, two other passages of Scripture, but I thought it was interesting when you see these two other passages, you see that Andrew has a pattern in his life that really reveals to us what a member of Team Unashamed is all about. Not only a follower, not only someone who finds other people, uh, but, peop but a man who brings people to Jesus. W watch this pattern. You've got to see this. It's kind of interesting. In John chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Now the Passover, uh, the feast of the Jews, was near. And, and therefore Jesus was lifting up his eyes, seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? You, something you need to know about Jesus, he never asks a question that he doesn't already know the answer to, okay? Because he's God, okay? So he, and again, when he asked the question, what are you seeking, he already knew the answer. When, when Jesus asked the question, uh, uh, he says, uh, where should we buy bread for, so that these people may eat? He already knows the answer to it. Verse 6 says, this he was saying to test him. For he himself knew what he was intending to do. And we know the story. He ends up feeding 5,000 people that day. Well, how did he do it? Where did he get it? Philip answers and says to him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive even a little. In other words, if we pulled all of our money and we could gather 200 denarii, we still wouldn't have enough to feed everybody, Lord. In other words, what you're asking for us to do is impossible. So Andrew steps up. And here's what we read about Andrew. One little verse says this. Uh, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, watch this. There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? <laughs> okay, what did he do? When there was a problem, Andrew was still bringing people to Jesus. I don't know what the answer to the, I don't know what the answer is, Lord, but here's a little boy. He's got five loaves of bread, and he's got two fish, and I don't know what you can do with them, but here he is. Listen, many of us, the very same way, we will think to ourselves, I don't have enough. I, I don't know enough. Do you realize God never, you got to hear this, Andrew was a fisherman. Jesus didn't say, you know what, if you want to be my follower, make sure you go to seminary, spend four years there. When you know enough, then you can follow me. Here's what Jesus is saying. Bring me what you have, and I'll multiply it. M many of us don't even catch this. Some of you think, well, I don't know enough. Just give what you have, and God will bless it. Just, that's, that's what a follower does. Lord, I don't have enough. That's okay. What do you have? If you'll do that, I'll multiply it. Andrew says, I don't know what, I don't know what we're going to do, but this is what we have. I'm going to bring it to you. Listen, 
Andrew was all about bringing people to Jesus. Later on in Jesus' life, last day before Jesus took the Passover, before he goes to the cross, I want you to read this. This John chapter 12 tells us a story. Jesus was getting ready to sit down to receive the meal. And the Bible says this, uh, John 12, verse 20 says, Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. Talking about the feast of Passover. These were Gentiles. These were people who did not know God. Verse 21 says, These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, and they began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Okay, when someone wants to meet Jesus, what do we do? Well, Philip didn't know. So Philip, next verse, came and told Andrew. And Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. Okay, here, here, let me tell you what the answer is. Bring people to Jesus. This is what Andrew's life was about. Andrew brought his brother. Andrew brought a little boy. Andrew brought these Gentiles. He said, we want you to meet Jesus. This is what his life was all about. Now, we're not told about the rest of Andrew's life. We don't know. Uh, everything else that we know about Andrew is all what we call tradition. In other words, there's no good written record to know exactly what happened to him. But tradition holds some very interesting things about Andrew's life. Tradition says that after Jesus' resurrection from the dead and after uh, Jesus ascended back into heaven and after Pentecost, tradition holds that Andrew then began to move north. And he went as far as what we call today uh, Russia. And that he went to the Russian people and began to share faith in Jesus Christ with them and was in Russia bringing people to Jesus. Now, uh, the Bible doesn't, the Bible actually refers to Russians in a different way. It doesn't call them Russians. Obviously, they didn't have the name Russia at the time. Uh, but the Bible actually refers to the Russians as barbarians. <laughs> May still be the same. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> but here's what you got to get. Andrew was about bringing people to Jesus. Several years later, his brother Peter was taken to Rome to be executed because of his faith in Jesus. And Peter asked that they, they were getting ready to crucify him, and they, he asked that they not crucify him in the normal way. Because he felt like, even though he knew he was going to die, he didn't feel worthy to, be, to die in the same way that Jesus died. And so tradition holds that they took and they put him on a cross upside down and crucified him in that way. Within just a very short period of time, they brought his brother Andrew, according to tradition, to Rome to also face the same death of crucifixion. But because Andrew's faith was so great, they decided to make his punishment even greater. And so rather than putting him on a cross right side up that we see that's like the T-cross, or rather than putting him on a cross that's upside down, they took him and put him on what's called a, sal a saltier cross, which... We think of a cross in the T form, right? But this cross was in the X form. And rather than nailing him to the cross, tradition holds that they tied him and bound him to that cross. And the reason they would do that is so that you would live for a lot longer. You would not get food. You would not get water. You would be flogged. You'd be daily spat upon. You'd be insulted. And so for tradition holds for over two days, Andrew hung on the cross Outside of Rome, on the road, people would come by, and they would insult him. But here's the thing that tradition says. Tradition says the entire time, Andrew would see the people, and he was moved with compassion, and he would try and bring them to Jesus from the cross. He never stopped telling people about Jesus, even in his death. A little over 300 years passed by, and there was a Roman emperor who came and was so moved, the way the tradition says, he was so moved by the story of Andrew and his willingness to lay down his life for the gospel of Jesus Christ that he went and he found the bones of Andrew. And he carried his bones, as tradition says, all the way to Scotland as they began to set up a new kingdom in Scotland. And as they set up the kingdom in Scotland, this Roman emperor said, let's never forget what Andrew did. And so they created a flag that to this day is the same flag that they use in Scotland. Let me show it to you so you can see. Now, all we know is that tradition holds this. But here's what I saw when I saw this. I thought, hmm, even to this day, even in his death, there's a symbol that says you need to meet Jesus. And still to this day, he's bringing people to Jesus. I wonder how many of us would say, 
See, I, I was thinking one day I'm going to die, I'm going to go to heaven, and I hope that the Lord will say of me, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let, someone says, well, how, how do you get that status of well done, my good and faithful servant? Okay, real simple, that people will begin to say of us, uh, Mark Allen, he brought people to Jesus. That was his number one goal in life is that people would come to know Jesus. Listen to me. This is what every member of Team Unashamed is about. I'm going to bring people to Jesus. I'm going to bring people to Jesus. I'm going to bring my family to Jesus. I'm going to make sure that there's no one that I come across their path that I don't tell them about Jesus. And may we be the standard bearers. May we be the banner in front of people that when they see our life, they'll say, maybe they don't come to Jesus, but they'll say, that's someone who wants people to come to know Jesus. They're all about that. I found this verse of scripture, and I'll close with this. The Apostle Paul writes this, and I, I don't think, I don't know that he wrote it about Andrew. We're not told that he wrote it about Andrew, but as I read it, I thought that just so typifies who Andrew really is. I want to read it for you. The Apostle Paul says this in Colossians 11. He says, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew. You may remember when we started this, we talked about, I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where is the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. Notice this says, there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, and freeman. But Christ is all in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, he's talking to those who are followers of God, as those who are chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. See, God's not calling you to go and chastise your family because they don't know the Lord. God's calling you with love and compassion and gentleness and kindness and humility to go to your family and say, let me tell you, I have met the one. I have met the one who took away the sins of my life. And he'll change your life too. We need to be that kind of brother. Are we our brother's keeper? Yes, we are. The answer, the question is, will you? Will you? Can I pray for you today? ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. I always ask myself this question every week when I'm studying and preparing for the message. And I always ask the Lord, what, Lord, what is it that you're saying to me through this message? Lord, what are you saying to others through this message? And so I'd like to ask you to do the same thing. Just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today through this message? What are you saying to me? When I was praying that I felt like the Lord kind of laid two things in my heart. One is that there might be some people who are here today that you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I feel like the Lord told me that if you'll come, uh, he'll meet you and you'll see. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Bible says if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. I, I want that kind of life for you. I really do. So if the Lord is speaking to you, to you today about your salvation, in just a moment, our prayer team is going to stand. And when they do, just stand up with them. Come here to the front. Put your hand in one of their hands and just say, hey, I need to meet this Jesus that this pastor was talking about. I thought the second thing, as I was praying, I felt like the Lord said to me, many, many people who are here have family members who don't know the Lord as Savior. And they've not told them. Not told them because of shame or embarrassment. here's what I felt like the Lord said to me today if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear them and I will heal them and I'll forgive them and here's what I, my word for you today if you're here today and you have a family member a mother a father grandparents aunts uncles cousins nieces nephews sons daughters grandchildren if you have a family member who doesn't know the Lord, I want to pray for you. And here's what I'm going to pray so that you understand. I'm not going to pray that God will send someone else to see them. I'm going to pray that God will give you a boldness you have never had before. And with what little you have, you'll present it. 
And then you'll just trust God by faith to multiply it. So can I pray for you? Can I pray for that you'll become an Andrew? Can I pray for you that you'll be a manly man? That you'll be a godly woman? That you'll have boldness and bravery in your life? Can I pray for you? If you want prayer today, you have a family member who doesn't know the Lord. I want to pray for you. If that's you, I'm going to ask you just to lift up your hand and hold it up. I have a family member who doesn't know the Lord. And I'm concerned about their life. I'm concerned about their destination. Pastor, pray for me today. If that's you, hold it up. Let's not be ashamed. Let's just keep it up before the Lord. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus for every person in this room that has an uplifted hand. Many of them, Lord, I know by name. And in my heart, I call their names out before you. But even greater than that, I know you know their name. And I know you care about them. Many of them I know in their hearts, they've taken on themselves and thinking that they do not have the right words or the right things to say. But I'm calling on a holy God who can take the little that we have and multiply it in their lives. I pray you'll put a boldness and a bravery in us like we have never had before. Holy Spirit, that same spirit that was in Andrew, I pray you'll place within us today that we'll be about bringing people to you. And we commit our ways to you. We choose this day to join the team, to be unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do this week. Thank you how you're going to use my brothers and sisters. Thank you, God, that many people will come to know you. But, Father, we give the increase into your hands. It's not ours. So however you want to move, we pray you'll use each and every one of us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you need prayer today for any reason, maybe you haven't had the boldness that you need in your life, in just a moment our prayer team is going to stand up. Just stand and come with them. If, if maybe you're suffering with some kind of sickness, we'd like to pray for you today. And here's what we really, we, this is normal for us. I want you to know this is normal. Praying for people is normal for us. And when you come and we pray and God meets with us, that's normal. That's normal. And if you want, and sometimes we think, well, you know, I'll feel out of place. Listen to me. Don't be embarrassed. Let's be brave. The reality is we probably all need prayer. And so if you're thinking today, boy, I'd sure like to go, and I'd sure like to have someone pray over me. I'd sure like to have more boldness, or I'd sure like to come to know the Lord. Don't be embarrassed. In fact, here's what I'm going to invite you to do. In just a moment, I'm going to invite our prayer team to stand up. As soon as they do, just stand up with them and come with them. They'll think you're on the prayer team. They'll never know any difference, okay? Let's not be embarrassed when God wants to do something great in our life. Are you ready? Okay, if you need prayer... You make the first move. Just stand up. Come on, prayer team. Let's come to the front. If you need prayer, you come. We want to pray for you.